morning, everyone. Happy, happy Friday. Hope you are having a great day so far. So we had some tech challenges. Uh, we have the, the pleasure to start the day sharing the SRE challenges on moving from monolithic to microservices, but not only the challenges, also the highlights, what we've learned in the journey so far. Starting with a little bit of an introduction of ourselves. So I am Andrea. I'm leading the SRE and operations teams at Adidas Digital. So our scope is the e-commerce platforms. We have the websites globally. We also have the applications, so the mobile app, the confirmed app, and Runtastic is also onboarding to our ecosystem, uh, based in Germany. And with me, I have Ravi. Hello, everyone. Ravi is SRE leading checkout and payments team. And we will share with you again our experience on this move. Right. A bit of an agenda to set expectations of so what we are going to talk during today and this session. So why we did the shift, where we went to, so what we did, the challenges, how we overcame the challenges, and obviously to finalize with uh, incident management. So everything starts with why. Why did we move? What was the problem? So it's just because Kubernetes is nice. It's just because AI is nice. But no, we did have some reasons. And now we will walk through four of them. So the main reasons why we did the shift. The first is faster time to market. So when I joined Adidas seven and a half years ago, we had six weeks release, life, uh, release cycle. So basically, the development team was working during six weeks. And then after that, we had a one day call with so many people in that call to go through all the changes, to go through everything that would be live. And at the end of the day, it was a little bit of throwing the ball to the other side. So development and operations were really separated. The second piece is, is scaling the infra faster. So this number is from last year, Black Friday, where as a consumer goods uh, during Cyber Week is one of our peak seasons. So is where we do have a huge spike in traffic and we needed to scale faster. So we can obviously talk about we have SLAs with vendors. Uh, they need to scale, yes, but it wasn't enough. We had a couple of times where we were unavailable. And if we are unavailable do, during Black Friday, for example, it's a big, big deal. So we needed to scale faster. We also needed to increase the throughput, the order throughput. There are some specific events that we run. There are some fast selling shoes, for example, that we need to make it faster. So our platform before was able to handle three to 4K orders per minute. Our current platform can handle more than 40,000 orders per minute. So it's a huge difference. And I can give one example. A couple of years back, we had one campaign that we had to last until like three days because we had to throttle a lot until we sell the whole stock. And this year, we had a similar campaign that we could run in a couple of hours. So we mobilize way less people and way less time. So it's much cheaper for the company to, to sell. Last but not least, uh, reducing operational costs and vendor dependency. Yes, if you put everything on paper, licenses, labor, platform costs, everything, uh, or it's cheaper. It's cheaper to operate. And obviously, we reduced the dependency that we had uh, with a specific vendor. So we had a big monolithic serving everything from front end to back end. Now we have full control, obviously much more complexity, but still we have a full control. These are the reasons mostly why we did the change, what we moved to, to a different platform. And uh, we implemented the Mach architecture, so some of you might know about it or not, but I will go through some of the details. Obviously this was not an SRE only uh, decision. It was architecture team, tech leads, SRE, so even business, right? Because even whenever you change the tech stack, business need to be uh, onboarded. They need to sponsor at the end of the day. So Mac architecture um, in a high level, microservices, API first, cloud native and headless. When we talk about microservices, what we've done is uh, each of the business capabilities, so to say, if you think about e-commerce, you think about checkout, you think about basket, promotions, login. So all of those business capabilities became uh, one microservices, uh, sorry, one microservice or more. And with that, also independent lifecycle. So each of those microservices have their own end-to-end -end CICD, for example. I will go to a bit of the details on the CICD specifically. So the teams are quite independent. API first. So at the beginning, I mentioned that our scope is uh, e-commerce, so the end to uh, the consumer end, website and apps. 
but we also have retail stores, we also have B2B, and we want to build once the capability, and we want to be able to use everywhere. So being channel agnostic help us, or working with APIs that we can explore and that we can extend to different channels, also uh, help with the re reusability. Cloud native, so here uh, we moved to um, Kubernetes and also some AWS services. And Adidas, in tech, we have two main departments. One is the platform engineering and the other is the application teams. We are both from application teams and we work obviously close to the platform teams where they are responsible to provide the platform. So Kubernetes, observability tools, fast data platform with Kafka. And the SRA team is basically in the middle of the development and the platform. So in, in the case of Kubernetes clusters, we have a dedicated team that provides the clusters, and then we get a namespace that we can use to set up the whole CI CD, we can use to set up the whole life cycle of the, of the services. Last but not least, headless. So again, if you work uh, in e-commerce, for example, it's very clear that the front end needs to have much more changes during the day than the back end. So Ravi is part of one of the front end teams, and we see that the daily deployments that we have, if you see the number of releases, is higher than the back end, which is obviously, it creates, it enables flexibility. So if a team needs to deploy more frequently, they are independent if a team needs to deploy less frequently. All right, this is what we, we went to. I will drill down a little bit on the CI CD to show you how we are enabling the developers, how we are automating as much as possible. You probably know uh, this screenshot if you work with Jenkins. Yes, we use Jenkins. You might like it or not, we might like it or not, but we use that. And it's all automated it's from, from the push from the developer to the, the, the deployment to Kubernetes. And we have three environments mostly, development, staging, and production. So the dev is working, creating a branch and work on the feature that they, or the bug fix that they need to do. They push the code. A trigger, there is a trigger to a Jenkins job that will do all the needful and deploy to the environment that is required to. We have it all integrated with Teams chat. So Teams, Microsoft Teams is our collaboration tool. And we've done that to bring more transparency and also the devs or anyone don't need to go to Jenkins um, console or Jenkins UI to see what is the status of the build. They get a feedback directly in Teams. And in teams, we have the whole product team. So not only dev, QA is product owner. Uh, we have agile masters. We have the whole dev team. And so the dev needs to go through the Visual Studio code and then uh, teams. That's the two tools that they mostly need to go. And uh, we also have another type of notification, also integrated with teams, um, that you have the possibility to deploy to production. If uh, a branch or if uh, um, any code that is deployed is allowed to go to production. We have an automation that will pop up a message in Teams, and you can click the button. Here was a conscious decision to not automate everything to production. So some teams are more mature, some teams are less mature. The more mature ones using Canary, for example, but we, we decided to, to not go all the way. It might change, uh, but for now, we still have the click of the button. Everything sounds good. Everything sounds fine. Uh, we moved from a big monolithic to microservices. But this is a real picture, a real screenshot from our APM tool. As you can see, we have a lot of services. So this is all the connections that we have. And what happens is before we had one monolithic, so one big service that we need to troubleshoot if we talk about SRE. And now if something goes wrong, we have all of this to figure it out, to make sure that we have proper logs, proper tracing, and the whole CI CD is also independent, so it means that the complexity is way higher than it was before. But don't get me wrong, I mean, that's uh, pros and cons, right? So that's why we are sharing the challenges and also how we overcame the challenges. So Ravi is gonna <coughs> go through the specifics, some of the examples. Thanks, thanks, Andrea. So, the fun part now, the SRE challenges. We really wanted to give you some classic challenges that we faced immediately once we shifted to the microservices. And the journey was, it was not completely flat right from the beginning since we started in the last year. And uh, uh, we, we, we also started to improve with each and every incident. 
And uh, yeah, here are some of the examples or the incidents that we encountered immediately once we shifted to the microservices. So without any delay, the first one, availability of service or the observability. I'm pretty sure everybody in this room might have already seen this meme. Uh, the good thing is that I was seen this prior to we shifted to the microservices. Uh, bad thing is that I had literally experienced that in the reality once we shifted to the microservices. So it, it, it all started from, uh, like it was, uh, we, we shifted to the microservices probably in July last year. And uh, it, was, it was not so long until, we, until we, uh, we got the first major incident exactly on the Black Friday. And uh, uh, the Black Friday for Adidas is one of the huge or like one of the peak seasons where uh, you have 10x traffic compared to, the, uh, compared to the normal days. Be it with the order volume or be it with the revenue, our traffic is like quite high during the uh, Black Friday or the Cyber Week. And exactly on that day, uh, we had one of the databases that is responsible for the coupons or the vouchers functionality. And this, because of the peak in traffic, it, it started to have the performance issues. And because of that, uh, a lot of calls getting piled up in the upstream services. The reason is that, I mean, we also found like multiple reasons for that. One is that, one thing is that uh, we did not have proper timeouts across, the, across different microservices. And we also found that there was, uh, you know, we did not have, some of the microservices were like not matured in terms of uh, the tracing and uh, the, the service which was also responsible for the issue. It did not integrate or did not have the tracing with our APM tool. And that's the reason why we had uh, like so much of downtime and our MTTR was like close to uh, 90 minutes and that too, when, when, when you're literally on the Black Friday, you know, the stress that each and SRE teams will be having in the call and randomly like all the teams are like going literally crazy. I mean, the, the main challenge was that we knew that something was wrong with the, uh, the, the coupon service. But the biggest challenge for, was, uh, for us was to pinpoint the exact issue because almost every call across all the microservices were failing. And it was not literally straightforward and then we had to uh, loop in a lot of teams and by that time it was all, almost like 90 minutes and uh, we, we lost a lot of orders. A lot of improvements out of this, which I will also be telling what we had done uh, you know, to improve uh, specific to this specific issue. Second one, uh, the breaking changes in deployments. Everybody knows what is a breaking change whenever we have a uh, newer version to the software or the SDK. Uh, changes like this needs to be carefully planned and deployed into the production. So you know there is a change into the, uh, there is a change in the response data structure, and then uh, the upstream services or the service which needs to consume this newer version, they need to uh, uh, you know carefully deploy these changes into the production. So in in Adidas, we uh, the microservices architecture is like we have the orchestration service that cascades the calls from different upstream services or the different channels uh, to the downstream services. And uh, when I said about the upstream or like different channels, we have .com, web, desktop, and we have mobile app. And uh, we also have the confirmed that is responsible for our hype articles or the most sort of articles. Uh, orchestration service takes calls from all these uh, channels and then it cascades to different uh, downstream services. And now this uh, particular orchestration service uh, had the change in the SDK version. And of course, uh, we had to accommodate the new SDK version. And, and like one day, everybody got together, and then we started to, we decided that, okay, let's do the deployment together, all, all, the, micro, all the microservices. And the orchestration service deployment was successful, and one of the teams, the .com, it, it had some issues with the deployment, for whatever reasons, with the Jenkins, and uh, that failed in between. And we realized that we, we, we are already with the different version and that is a train close to 35 minutes of uh, mean time to resolution. And uh, it's, it was no brainer for us. We, we realized uh, how much of dependency the whole architecture has now. And uh, we really wanted to improve more from the release, uh, release management perspective. Repeated code, uh, I'm pretty sure this is, I mean this, it's not specific to microservices, but I, I had, uh, we wanted to put it here because it's, uh, we also observe a lot of uh, things from the SRE perspective. Uh, I'm pretty sure like everybody adheres to the dry principle, but uh, uh, from SRE point of view, what, what, we, uh, what we really do, like the, res uh, the responsibilities of SREs in Adidas is that 
uh, we get the infrastructure from the platform team, as Andrea mentioned. But we are responsible for automating the entire uh, CICD pipelines. We are responsible for deploying our applications. We also take care of monitoring, observability, alerting from the SRE, uh, from the SRE responsibilities. Uh, and we, at some point earlier, we had like a couple of repositories and we had like few CICD pipelines. But then with, imagine like you have 10 to 15 teams now, 10 to 15 microservices. Everybody has their own CACD pipelines, and at some point we realized that we were repeating a lot of code. Uh, be it with deploying the Helm charts, or probably be it with the secrets management, uh, I don't know, be it with the security scan and, uh, or, or uh, sonar, sonar analysis. Uh, like I was also mentioning, SREs, we also take care of alerting. And we, we use Terraform uh, for automating the alerts, and uh, we also realized a lot of teams, they have different alerts and there was bigger need to even uh, reuse the code or like share uh, between the team members. So uh, yeah, we started to do a lot of things which I will also cover probably in the next slide. Uh, the security, uh, security again is a bit broader topic. Uh, it's, uh, I would, you know, we, we have, like as I mentioned, we already have the infrastructure from the platform. They give us a lot of security. I mean, they also take care of the infrastructure uh, from their side. But, uh, I mean, we, we all, from the deployment perspective, we also take care of protecting our ingresses or uh, uh, be it with the secret management. So we do all that. That is, uh, you know, it's the default like, like, like every company does. We, we also do that. But one of the bigger challenges for us is also dealing with the bots. Uh, there was also like recent study, like last year, I believe there was like one article published. Uh, top three out of five highest bot impacted sneakers are from Adidas. And imagine like whenever we have any of the uh, bigger launches or any of the high particles. So we, we, we are like more susceptible, uh, susceptible to the bots. And uh, we, we do a lot of things from the CDN. We also have the CDN that gives us like a lot of inbuilt features. And we, uh, you know, we, uh, we make sure that our uh, endpoints are protected. But uh, Again, we, we have the business teams, like Andy was mentioning, we have the business teams, we have, I mean, we are the SRE teams, and now business teams are like more particular about the false positives, SREs are like more prone to the, I mean, we, we are like more uh, into blocking the, uh, or more into the false negatives. And it was, it, it was not that easy. It was really tricky for us to balance between both false positives and false negatives. And uh, at least if I remember like, uh, you know, before three years, uh, we, I mean, again, bot attacks, it's not, uh, it just started with the microservices. We also had prior to that, but with microservices, it was like more and more endpoints, and uh, we really had to deal with that. And uh, at least earlier, three to four years or uh, before when, when, when we uh, used to get the, when we used to see the bot attacks, uh, it was not that difficult. So when, when we used to get that attacks, you, you have, you already have, some, uh, let's say you already have some proactive uh, measures that you do from the CDN perspective, also from the application side. There are also some reactive, like whenever, you know, you cannot uh, block the 100% of the bots, right? So there are some bots like that bypass all these features. And that, for that, you really, be, be, I mean, it was not that difficult like back then. So either we used to find the unique criteria, be it with user agents or you know, maybe TLS fingerprints or hash keys, uh, you know, a lot of criteria, like maybe the referrals. So we used to block, we did identify immediate land. It was pretty straightforward, uh, we, uh, either ASNs or the IP subnets. So it was straightforward, but currently the bots are like much more sophisticated. And uh, these days we are also seeing the attacks spanning across geographically. And uh, yeah, of course, the cloud native is for everybody, including the bots. So they just spin like different containers or the clusters in the cloud, and then uh, the attack is like massive. Uh, yep, so we, we also started working on that. Of course, authentication between the services. Okay, so challenges. These are only some of the challenges and we keep getting some of the issues like every now and then. And now, how, how did we start with the resilience since last year? I mean, we, it's, it's our continuous process, but uh, yeah, each failure for us is an experience. We, we, we start, uh, you know, we start working on that. We also have like, and there, now slide on the incident management, how do we deal with that? But uh, majorly, for example, the, the latency issue or the timeouts that I was explaining in the previous one, we started reviewing the timeouts across all the microservices. 
and we, we really, uh, you know, we implemented some time out, so we, dis we discussed like which area, or which microservice is the right place and what is the right time out that we need to put it, uh, put uh, for each of the endpoints for the calls. Of course, we implemented circuit breaking, Adidas, we also have the inbuilt feature flag tool, all of our major changes, uh, any, uh, so SREs in Adidas, we have uh, resilience and stability my, uh, as the mindset. And uh, whenever we release something into the production, the biggest change, we always make sure this is behind the feature flag. In fact, the entire transition from the monolith to the microservice was behind the feature flag. So with just one click, we were able to switch from the legacy to the, uh, the new microservice architecture. Of course, we have the Canary deployments. And uh, for the breaking changes, we also had the SDK versioning and the orchestration service already, uh, whenever, whenever they have the new version ready, they already deploy independently. And the upstream services, when we are ready, we just accommodate or, or we, uh, we, we just uh, talk to the newer SDK versions. Observability, of course, it's a mandatory thing for the SRE teams. We have the open tele telemetry with end-to-end -end tracing. Of course, we have the APM tool, uh, we use that. Uh, which also provides the default tracing, but we want it to be more uh, vendor agnostic, and we also have the open telemetry integrated. One thing we did with microservices is that prior to this, we had logs uh, for different micro, uh, so for different, uh, like couple of uh, applications, but all of them were segregated between different tenants. So with microservices, we really wanted to uh, do a bit differently so that we do not want to switch between different uh, tenants. We use open search. And then uh, within, in a single tenant, but the logs are separated between the different indexes. Of course, the observability dashboards, security. We also, uh, you know, do, we also protect our ingresses with the TLS certificates. And of course, we, uh, yeah, we used SOPs for authentic, uh, you know, encrypting all the certificates, uh, API credentials, everything. We use the Mozilla SOPs. And uh, we, we also have like, a lot of seed codes. Some of them are like, uh, like as I was also mentioning, we have the CDN. And whenever we have any change in the IP addresses of the edge servers, we had to adopt this new IP addresses across different origins. And for that, earlier we have like, we, you know, we were doing, we were just, we had to update this across like different indices. And now when, when we have the seed code, just that like we have one seed code, one place you update it, and then uh, you know, with annotations, we have that implemented across all the indices. And yeah, we, we, like, as I also mentioned, every failure is an experience for us. And we, we, it's not that easy to, uh, when you have so many teams, like 10 to like 15 microservices, it's not that straightforward to have the proper coordination and to improve on, uh, to improve on with each instance, unless you have very good incident management process. With that, I will hand it over to Andrea, who will walk through us on incident management. Thanks, Ravi. And I would say, it's way more than 15 microservices, no? Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> we have way more than that. Yeah. So incident management, if there is one thing that uh, our team knows is that, and I think everybody here in this room also knows that you can prepare as much as you can, but things will go wrong. And we need to be ready for that. So when we talk about incident management, our SRE and operations, uh, in our domain, we have two main teams. So one is the SRE team focusing in operations and engineering. And one is the service management team, which is focusing on processes, so processes creation and also processes audits. So we do have two teams working together to make sure that the processes that we have are adopted, be it incident management, product management, uh, release management, and you name it. So starting with this incident management, uh, but before that, we need to know what we are looking for. So we need to measure, we need to answer the question, what is the stability? For us, uh, what is this stability? And I think everyone here in this room should also uh, know from <laughs> what you take out. But anyways, we need to make sure that we know what is the stability that we measure, because if we don't measure, everything is fine. Everything is great. Um, we obviously use the, the famous metrics on MTTD, MTTR. But we also added one, which is the revenue impact. So being in an e-commerce platform, every outage might end up with a potential revenue loss. And this metric is something that we have a common language with business. Because if we say that we have a common uh, KPI and we don't go into that debate, should I prioritize value? Should I prioritize stability? No, we have one metric that we all understand. And at the end, it's all about money. So this is the one that we look up to and we keep uh, both teams reporting. We obviously need to have the priority metrics. So not everything is a major incident. 
Also, not everything is not an instant. So we need to have a comprehensive instant or priority matrix, so to say. In case um, a major incident is detected, is, it qualifies, it's a major one. We have the instant commander role. And this is the person that will, we have a whole process of major incident management. This person will be the one creating a bridge call. And this person is responsible to calling everyone that can help to fix the issue, be it SRE, be it developer, be it market, because we provide services for the markets and the market people also need to get their input in. So the goal of this call is to ensure that we either mitigate or fix the issue. And there is only one rule, which is we don't close the communication until this is mitigated, if it's qualified as a major incident, right? All the communication is also managed by the incident commander. Once the incident is closed, so it can be 90 minutes, as Ravi said, it can be eight hours. There are some that take longer, so we usually drop the call and reconvey after some time. So it depends the type of incident. We want to have as less minutes as possible, but still there are some that last longer. Once the incident is mitigated or fixed, the next day we have the incident debrief, or RCA, as you call, uh, where we go through the why, 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 right? Everything that, what happened? So basically to understand what was the issue, what did we miss? We have a template, we go through technical components, what we missed technically, is it observability missing, was it a testing missing, uh, process-wise, so what happened uh, to really understand? Here we, we try to have the, not the try, but we foster the blameless culture, we foster the, you should have a safe space to say, hey, I made a mistake, I missed something. Obviously, depending on the maturity of the person, the maturity of the team, there are some people that are more shy to say, yes, I made a mistake. There are some others that just say, yeah, I made a mistake, and that's fine, but we do, and even our leadership team really uh, encourages. So uh, it, it's great to see that the team, back, everybody backs up each other, so which is good. Um, but that's the whole point of having the incident debrief, really going to what actually happened and create action items. So then we have the last piece, which is the problem management. So once you had a major incident, you have a problem, you have all the action items, be it technical, be it process. And we have the service management team, which is always on top of all the major incidents, making sure that it doesn't get uh, lost, uh, what needs to be done. And we get it all prioritized. So in this talk, we try to share with you our experience on why we did that, where we moved to, the challenges that we faced, how we overcame the feed feedback loop with incident management. And I want to finalize with uh, this nice phrase, uh, excellence is not a destination, it's a continuous journey that never ends. So basically, this, that was our journey, moving from monolithic to microservices. There is another one coming up with Gen AI. There is something else that will eventually pop up, and it's a continuous uh, like continuous learning, so to say. Yeah. Thank you very much, and we'll be here today. Happy to get any feedback from you. Thank you. Thank you.